Hello everybody and welcome to the second video in the second lecture on the chain ladder method. In this video I'm going to cover the two key preparatory steps you need to take with your internal data before you begin modeling. These are check it for completeness and check that it is correct. Again if you haven't watched my earlier videos and I really recommend you cycle back now to help you keep everything in context and to ensure you are thinking holistically. So let's start by discussing the steps you need to take around data completeness. Remembering back to the policy life cycle, we know there's going to be two key sources of internal data for us to consider when applying the chain ladder method. This is the policy database, which is created from all the policy files we've written, and the claims database, which is created from all the claims we've received. Actually speaking, the policy database it's going to contain two key sets of information for your model. That's premiums and exposure. This information is going to come in two forms, triangles and vectors. I'll talk a lot more about triangles in the next video, but for now it's important to know that data held in vector form, these rectangles, has no development, whereas data held in a tri triangular form develops over time. In fact, the chain ladder method itself is a way to turn triangles into vectors or squaring the triangle as some matrix put in. So a vector is going to have one value for every row, whereas triangles will have many columns of values for each row, and some rows will have more development than others. So let's look at exposure data. This can come in a multitude of times. At its simplest, it may just be a count of policies, but it could also be a more risk-dependent type of exposure, such as turnover or payroll for a commercial insurance, or maybe even an objective or subjective risk index representing the underlying level of risk taken on during the relevant period. And generally as an actuary, the more measures of exposure you have, then the more readily you can put your chain ladder model results into context, which is a fundamental tool to help you understand your models and to improve them over time. For example, we discussed in an earlier video how looking at claim numbers against exposure will give you a measure of the frequency of claims, which should be comparable over time and across modeling segments. If you look into your policy database and find there's little or no exposure data for you to use, then you can really add value to the organisation by tracking down such data or by lobbying to get it included in future evolutions of the policy database. If we look now at premiums, this will tend to come in both written and earned varieties. It can include or exclude insurance tax, it can include or exclude commission and brokerage, and you need to ensure you're using the correct type for your modelling purposes. Premiums are really useful at giving context to claim amounts, with the loss ratio metric probably being the most famous of these, which looks at the claim amounts divided by the premiums for the similar period of time. However, extracting these triangles and vectors is not the end of your analysis of the policy database. There are many detailed exhibits you can extract from the policy database, using database software or tools like Python and R. I'm not going to list them all here as which to use will very much depend on your needs, the information available in your policy database, and sometimes how much time you have. However, you can think about this by going through the policy life cycle step by step, and considering the type of metrics which could be tracked. Think about changes over time to the type of customer, the policy sold, how those policies have been sold, the duration of those policies, the classes, the regions, the perils, the exclusions, the list goes on, and all can have a direct impact on the model we are trying to build. I assure you, if you take the time to think about these issues and extract information from the policy database and understand what you, what you get out, your models will become that much more predictive and reliable. Talking of which, this is a great point for you to be noting whether there's even enough data to model a segment using the chain ladder method. Are there segments you have which have only just begun on underwriting or where the volumes have ramped up recently or where the mix has changed? The chain ladder method isn't the only tool in the Atri's armory, and knowing when not to use it is a key skill for you to develop. Now let's have a look at the claims database. So this is only ever going to provide us with triangle data, because we're never going to know at the inception of the policy whether we will have any claims or how much those claims will cost, and these things will develop over time until every claim is ultimately settled. If you do know how many claims you're going to get at the outset of writing a policy, then this is either not insurance or financial insurance, and these should be setting off all kinds of professionalism alarms when you spot them. 
Let's start by looking at open claim numbers. So we know from the policy life cycle we studied before that these open claims are going to be created as soon as a claim is notified to the insurer. So these open claim numbers are going to grow over the coverage period as more insured events occur. And don't forget there can be notification delays. And so open claim numbers are going to grow initially before eventually more and more claims are closed down and that's going to outweigh the number of new notifications and so open claim numbers will then start dropping over time. And the pattern you get from this really depends on the mix of exposure period and notification patterns which can really vary enormously between one class and another. So there's no set pattern. We generally expect there to be a sort of steady increase in open claim numbers hitting a peak after you know, maybe two years or so and then gradually falling over time until eventually the open claim numbers must be zero because we've settled all the claims. If we turn to closed claim numbers, again we know that these are going to be made at various stages of our policy life cycle when an open claim is closed. Again the pattern's going to vary depending on open claim trends and also the time it takes to assess and dispute known claims and to maybe go through court to settle them. So closed claim numbers are going to grow much more slowly initially than open claims before increasing more rapidly over time and then slowing down once you've only got a small number of um, complicated open cases going through courts and, and mediation. We'll discuss these various patterns in more detail in a later video. For now the key thing to note is that the reported claims triangle is simply the sum of your open and closed claim triangles. Um, and so the reported is going to be at least as big as, as either of these two metrics. Secondly, ultimately, at the end of the day, every single claim is going to be closed, which means that open must be zero, and therefore the count of closed ultimately at the end will be the same as the number of reported claims. So the fact that closed and reported must ultimately develop to the same final position is of fundamental importance when building chain ladder models. Why do I say this? Well firstly it means you really must model closed and reported claim numbers because they're both going to predict the same thing, the total number of claims which will be received by the insurer. So by, by modelling both you get two bites of the cherry predicting the ultimate outcome for claim numbers. And secondly, because both should give the same result, you're going to get one of two outcomes either the separate closed and reported chain ladder models are going to give you pretty much the same answer, in which case, great, you've got a lot more confidence in the result, or the two separate models are not going to end up at the same place, in which case you need to understand why. And in my experience, the two most likely causes for any misalignment, and both of which are invaluable for you to know, are either there's some distortion in the policy life cycle that you aren't properly allowing for in your models, or you simply don't have enough history in which to build your models. The assumptions you are making to fill in this gap are not correct. The last few comments on claim numbers before I move on to the claim amount side here. So it's worth considering if you want to model including or excluding nil claims, i.e. those claims which we know from studying the policy life cycle are going to settle at no cost to the insurer. It may be technically better to model both including and excluding nil claims and then to consider the nil rate and what it means for the policy life cycle, but oftentimes there's a lot of additional models that don't give you a huge benefit. Another thing to be aware of is that if the insurer is writing a lot of border road business, then claim number data may not be available or may be so distorted as to be nonsensical. It's also quite common across London market type business to have limited availability and reliance on claim numbers. And that's fine if the business really is hugely exposed to large claims, but don't just assume that's the case. Instead, depend Spend a few minutes satisfying yourself that the claim numbers data is really not helpful before moving on to claim amounts. And as discussed a few times now, claim numbers drive the claim frequency metric, which is really helpful for context. What's more, if you know how many claim numbers are coming in, you can also put claim amounts into context by using the average cost per claim metric. You talk to claims people about frequency and average cost, you'll be talking in their language and come across as much more credible than if you just focus on loss ratios and purely claim amounts. So let's switch over to the amount side here. So if we look at outstanding amounts, well again, these are created, we know from our study of the policy life cycle, these are created every time the claim is notified to the insurer and they are often initially set by standard case reserving approaches and then potentially later by claim assessors internal or external to the business. The rules are updated regularly through the claims life to allow for new information and also inflation. 
So things can be volatile initially. And also, once you get many years into the development and only have a handful of large, complicated claims remaining open that's subject to the impact of court judgments. Outstanding claim amounts are going to grow over the coverage period and beyond due to notification delays before reducing over time if claims are closed. It would be reasonable to expect outstanding claim amounts to peak later than open claim numbers will, as you can have a small number of large claims which are going to push up the outstanding amounts. But they must also reach zero, exactly the same point that open claims do, because once all the claims are closed, there should be nothing outstanding left on the system. Paid claim amounts are going to accumulate throughout the policy life cycle, every time a claim is closed at cost or whenever partial payments are made, for example to cover legal costs or to settle a part of an individual claim. There can be very large spikes in payments when large claims are settled, and so paid claim amounts can be erratic in the tail of the development. As with closed claim numbers, paid claim amounts will grow slowly initially before increasing more rapidly, and then again slowly tailing off once we're dealing with all the large claims in the tail, and ultimately stopping development once all the claims are closed. Again, we'll discuss these patterns in more detail in a later video. For now, the key thing to note is that incurred to claim amounts are the sum of the paid and outstanding amounts, and so it'll be at least as big as either triangle at any point in time. Secondly, once every claim is paid, outstanding is zero, and hence paid claims equals incurred claims. Similarly, for closed and reported, the fact that paid and incurred must reach the same final or ultimate position is of fundamental importance in building chain networks. So these two we should model separately, we should check that they converge, and we should investigate any discrepancies when they do diverge. Last few comments on claim amounts before I move on to checking internal data correctness. It's worth considering if you want to model amounts including or excluding salvage and subrogation, i.e. those recoveries which insurers make from other parties. It may be technically better to model both including and excluding salvage and subrogation, and then to consider the salvage rate and what it means for the policy life cycle, but oftentimes again, this is just a lot of additional models that don't give a huge benefit. In my personal experience, pay claims were an underutilised resource by actuaries. Arguments for focusing on incurred claims only include the impact of large claims on paid development, particularly in the tail, incurred claims developing to ultimate quick, quicker, the time required to model another data set, and incurred claims containing more information. However, it's worth considering the validity of pay claims further. They're entirely based on objective data, whereas incurred claims include outstanding amounts which is subjectively set by claim departments based on rules and customs which can and do change over time. Customers generally want their claims paid as quickly as possible, and so although longer, paid patterns are often more stable bases from which to project. The impact of large claims is often less severe than feared, and your approach to granularity can really help here to isolate such distortions. I'll cover granularity in a later video. As discussed earlier, having two separate models to assess the same outcome i.e. paid and incurred chain ladder models, gives you much more confidence in the modelled outcome, and also lots of value-adding actions if they don't align. So the extra time spent is well worth the effort, in my opinion. Lastly, as an actuary, we're in many ways looking to check that the incurred claims are reasonable, and there are no issues with outstanding claim amounts. However, if you use the incurred claims as your key source of information, then you're implicitly giving the claims department a clean bill of health without even checking that this fact is true. So please don't overlook paid claims. The extra time you invest to consider this valuable source of information will pay you back in spades. Moving on, again, as per the policy database, extracting triangles is not the end of your analysis of the claims database. Again, there's many detailed exhibits you can extract from the claims database using database software or tools like Python and R. Again, I'm not going to list them all, but just again, go through the policy life cycle step by step and consider the type of metrics we could be tracked about changes to the type of customer, policy sold, how they're sold, classes, regions, perils, exclusions. But then on top of that, also think about the insurer's approach to standard case reserving, to considered case reserving, to fighting validity of claims or quantum of claims, to regularly reassessing case reserves, to mediation, the list goes on, and all again can have a direct impact on the model we're trying to build. Again, I assure you, if you think about these issues, collect good objective data on them, and seek to understand the outputs, your models would be much more predictable and reliable. And 
And again, this is the time to check. Do you really have enough data to model a segment using the chain ladder method? Are there segments with, they might have a lot of premium, but little or no claims, which are subject to very large claims. Again, the chain ladder method isn't the only tool in your armory. And knowing when not to use it is just as important as knowing how to use it well. Let's now talk about checking internal data correctness. I believe there are three key steps you should be taking to ensure the data you will be modelling is reliable before you do any modelling at all. If you just jump in and use the wrong data, then all your modelling efforts are wasted when you spot the error, or even worse, misleading if you never do spot the error, or even worse than that, if someone else spots it for you while you're presenting your results. As an actuary, you have a duty to ensure the data you're using is correct. Insurance companies have failed on the back of modelling the wrong data. You do not want to end up in court defending why you didn't carry out these basic checks before you started modelling. So what are these steps? Well, the first of these three checks is ensuring that the claims database reconciles back to the financial reporting system of the insurer. This should be a pretty straightforward mathematical step and one that should be easy to set up and repeat every time you do your analysis. Secondly, you should ensure any overlapping data between this time and last time is fully reconciled. Again, it's easy to set something up mechanical to check that all those triangles and vectors are consistent to ensure that the data is reliable. Again, straightforward and no excuses for not doing this. Lastly, and more tricky, but probably most importantly, does the new data you've got look reasonable when compared to last time's data? There's going to be a range of subjective and objective tests which you could apply here. Have you used your previous models to estimate what this time's data will look like? If so, does it compare well? Obviously, it won't ever be perfect matching, but is it within reasonable bounds? And looking subjectively, does the new data look reasonable? Is it reasonable for an older year to suddenly see lots and lots more claims reported or lots fewer claims reported or incurred? Why are the outstandings much bigger or smaller in every year, this time rather than last time? Again, thinking about what you're doing and how the policy lifecycle could produce such changes, or how it couldn't, will help you to ensure the data you're using is robust or you rely upon it for modelling. So that's everything I'd like to cover in this video on internal data. I look forward to the next video where I'll be explaining to you about the preparatory steps you need to take about granularity again before you start any modelling at all. So please like and subscribe to support these videos and do let me know your comments and feedback on these videos in the comments below. Thank you.